Welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Carissa Kranz. We are following closely today the 1983 cold case out of Georgia. This is a case with Timothy Coggins was the victim, Jeffrey Gebhardt, the defendant. Coggins was allegedly stabbed by Gebhardt more than 30 times and then tied to the back of a truck and dragged up and down a rural street to be covered in blood and mud because he was hanging out with Gebhardt's lady friend. A, 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 a racially motivated case, 1983, a cold case until possibly now might be closed. With me, Linda Kenny Bodden on set. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay. I'm happy to be here to discuss this horrible case. It is awful. So, you know, here we are, 35 mm -hmm. years later, trying to resolve this case with limited evidence. Um, but, you know, we're going to replay that evidence and some testimony um, coming up. But here we are trying to replay this case, piece it together and solve it when 35 years ago we could not. Well, so what's the difference in the... Sure. So that's what I want to yeah, ask you. What's I, the difference I, in the, the time periods yeah, between I, now I, and I then? I think that a lot of things have changed. First of all, since the early 1990s now, prosecutors have been looking at these cold cases where they had a suspect and couldn't, didn't convict him. And the lead case on this was Medgar Evers. Uh, when he was killed and assassinated, he, his, the person uh, got away with it until the 1990s. A cold case again, but the suspect was always the suspect mm -hmm. for a period of time. So I would imagine that Mr. Gebhardt was always the suspect. But back in the 1980s, although it is surprising, apparently this community, oops, in Sunnyside, Georgia, did not, um, excuse me, that something fell, but did not uh, really take these cases easily. I mean, they, it was, it, there was racism all around. Let's face it, so, this, right. let's call it, it was racism. So, so there was racism on the part of the defendant, there was racism on the part of the police department, Absolutely. there was racism on the part of the prosecution. Right. So this was a racially motivated case, no matter how you and cut no one, it. And no one cared. You had a two department, uh, two department sheriff's office, police department, and they didn't really care about this. And what's surprising about in the 1980s, we should be ashamed that this happened to this poor young man. So is this an uphill battle for the prosecution right now? Because they have to basically present this case saying, hey, the police department wasn't interested and the prosecution wasn't interested, so we don't have evidence, and we're sorry we don't have evidence, and there's no DNA, but by the way, that guy did it. But, but we had people that came forward at that time. We knew where Timothy Coggins was. We knew he left his house. We knew who he was with. And we have now a, probably a snitch who's probably going to confirm all that. And, you know, snitches are very powerful. Remember, there's not many people in this community that had a motive to kill Timothy Coggins. So it's going to go down to motive, which, which can stay and exist the whole period of time for 35 years. That doesn't go away. It's going to yeah. go down to people that was with either Gephardt or her Gephardt made statements along the years. Right. And many cases are won and lost on overwhelming circumstantial evidence, even when there's no direct evidence. Especially so maybe civil this rights one. cases after a long time when the suspect was a suspect from day one till now. Okay, so we're going to go right now to a clip. In the courtroom, um, This uh, the witness is Tal Talisa Coggins. This is the victim's sister. Such sad testimony. That's Talisa Coggins, the victim's sister. As you can see, even 35 years later, she is emotional on the stand, recounting what happened to her brother, identifying the body, and then talking about how she was intimidated and threatened to be your next. With me on set, Linda Kenny Bodden. Linda, you know, gosh, we're hearing this. It is right, so, right. it is so sad. You know, it's a, uh, what, a brick came through the window? Is that oh, what I heard gosh. properly well, you know in the what? testimony? My first reaction was Sunnyside, Georgia wasn't too sunny back in those days, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but yes, the first thing was she heard a lo large knock or something banging a door and it was a brick that came through and it said either hush or shut up your next. And so that was a threat. And then, and right, was there threat. was a threat and then it was, I, could, I think there was some debate whether we could hear her testimony, right? right. Was it a dog or a doll that went through, that was, the, the head was on the front doorstep and then the actual body was thrown through the uh, window I, with I a brick? I heard a doll with the head cut off, a black doll with the head cut off, but it was something. Whatever it was, it almost doesn't matter. It's just outrageous. Well, Can you imagine the fear of this woman? Oh, yeah. Just to help with the police when her brother has been brutally stabbed like a, basically like a barnyard animal. Right. right? And so the key word was shut up. You're next. You're next. Is and the, then right. what else is key is it was a black doll. Right. Or, so right. which shows it is racially Whatever motivated. It was, with, with anything black with its head cut off was definitely racially motivated. No doubt about it. So yeah. not only do you have them losing her brother and you see that she's crying all these years later, but then she gets attacked for just helping the police identify her brother, and probably because she thought that maybe 
that she has some information that would lead to Frankie Gephardt. Obviously, and that is scared. She wasn't talking to the police no matter what. I can tell you back in the 1980s when this is happening and she's scared like this, and the police department is two people who aren't taking this case seriously, she wasn't talking to anyone after this happened. Right. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be her, to be sitting there having to relive these moments on the stand and then watching this trial, watching it live in the courtroom, and then just wanting closure, wanting to be validated, wanting, wanting to know someone's going to be held accountable for killing brutally murdering her brother and intimidating her and silencing her voice. I mean... Yeah, and, and you see, you know, it's, it's amazing because as we discussed before, there has been a lot of prosecutions in the last 20, 25 years dealing with cold cases uh, because of racial crimes that occurred a long time ago. And murder has no statute of limitations, as we know, which means you can bring it any time in the future, no matter what. And so to see her, it's all coming out, right? Her loss of her brother, the fact nothing was done, it's just all coming out in the stand. This is a real trial. This is real emotion. This is not made up. No, it's not made up, and it, it, it's definitely emotional for a jury to hear this, um, even without any DNA evidence, to just know and to have the background information that she's being intimidated to not talk, which helps bolster the prosecution's case of why there's a lack of evidence, which you bring up a really good point, a 1983 case, and a lot of these cases now are being revisited That's because right. there is no statute of limitations, and now they can possibly be closed and have closure for the family. And, and the the community is going to be a lot different. That racial pan, the racial panel motive of the community and the jury is a lot different than it was well, then. And we, luckily, we're in a different time now, and maybe there can be justice. We do need to throw to a quick break, but stick with us. And when we get back, we're going to continue following this Frankie Gebhardt trial. Stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Carissa Kranz. We are following today really closely. Our main trial is the Frankie Gebhardt trial. Frankie is the defendant, the victim, Timothy Coggins. This is a 1983 cold case out of Sunnyside, Georgia, which my guest Linda said to, earlier today, Sunnyside was not so sunny. That's right. Real, not so sunny. Not so sunny. Th this case, for anyone just joining us, it's a racially motivated cold case. Um, it's It happened in Georgia. Uh, the victim was stabbed and beaten up brutally, then tied to the back of a truck and, dra and dragged up and down a dirt road. Uh, never had any closure. 35 years later, here we are finally trying this case. We just heard on the stand from the, uh, def the victim's sister, really emotional testimony. And now we are going to go to testimony from Jesse Gates. That's the next prosecution's witness. He is a friend of the victim's family, and he worked as a deputy back at the sheriff's department 35 years ago. So he has, or he can lend some pretty important insight to the circumstances of why this investigation may not have been done properly. Let's take a look in the courtroom. That is Jesse Gates. He is a friend of the victim's family, and he was also a deputy sheriff at the time of this uh, brutal murder of the victim, uh, Timothy Coggins. With me, Linda Kenny Bodden. You know, what a sad case. We're listening to a deputy who, you know, was a friend of the victim at the time, warning him, telling him, if you want to date a, ca a Caucasian girl, a white girl, that you need to go to Atlanta to do that. And ironically, he's hanging out at the club, people's choice. Like right. he should have a choice. Right, but but you know what's interesting about this witness is number one, first of all, he is black back in the 1980s, so he knew the climate. And one of the things when you try a case, as you very well know, our viewers may not, is that when you're a lawyer, uh, you have to tell the jury what you're going to tell them. You have to then tell them, and then you have to tell them what you told them. And when you what you tell them is through witnesses. And here, what the prosecution talked about the climate in the opening, he says it was a terrible climate. And we're not talking about sunny again, because it's nope. not sunny. Not sunny. Uh, but there were KKK rallies, there were KKK parades, and this officer knew that a black man in the 1980s in Sunnyside in Spalding County could not date a white woman because there'd be danger. Right. Yep, he's setting the stage. Um, clearly in his testimony, he's setting the stage of the time that this murder happened. It's a very different time than now. And the jury needs to have that explained. I mean, 
we don't know the ages of the jurors sitting there, but based on when they, you know, how old they are, they may or may not be aware of these circumstances and the it, it, political, social, cultural environment of the time. We're going to continue with testimony from Jesse Gates. Um, he's the victim's family friend, the victim's friend at the time, and he was a deputy officer at the sheriff's department back in 1983. We're going to go back and take a look into the courtroom. So that is testimony from Jesse Gates, a friend of the victim and a deputy at the time, 35 years ago. Really interesting testimony. He's setting the stage of danger, danger, the segregation, how he was going to a club and he wasn't supposed to socialize with any white women. And then he points out how that night in question, how he saw with his own eyes three white men outside of the People's Choice Club, and he thought that that was unusual. Linda, what do you make of this testimony? Well, you know, it's setting the stage for the life or the end life of, of Timothy Coggins, and that's what's, you know, great about watching this, though. Yes, this was terrible, but we're going to maybe get some justice for Timothy Coggins, but if not, we're going to know who he is, know a lot about him, and this sets the stage about his last time on earth. Yeah, it sets the stage that Timothy Coggins, listening to this testimony, may not have been aware of the danger of the circumstances around what he was doing. He was just enjoying his life and had a connection and had fun. But this cop was warning him, hey, you know, friend, I work, in the, I work at the police station. You need to watch out for this. We have to go to a quick break, but please stick with us. We're going to continue with this trial and further testimony and hopefully have a verdict at the what appears to me. That is direct examination of Jesse Gates, the prosecution's witness. And you're hearing there that the the this um, witness was a friend of the victim's family, but he was also a deputy at the time of the sheriff's department. And he is explaining, he is saying how he was basically silenced and how he, in his professional opinion, the proper investigation was not done. And that he tried to develop leads and he was told to stop. And that the, the police department shut him down. And not only that, the black community was also shutting down and afraid to talk. A major case of intimidation at the time. And it, it, it really, it really, really, really is a sad case. Linda, you know, I mean, we're, we're hearing this testimony. I mean, forget about the legal legal analysis right, right. and mumbo-jumbo. Let's just talk about, like, life and, and what was going on in this community at that time you know, in this police department with this homicide, with this murder. Right. I mean, it is, this is, there's, there, he is saying that, which sets the stage for the prosecution's case to be bolstered in front of a jury. He is saying, we don't have evidence because this case was silenced. Well, he was also saying, he's even saying even more than that. First of all, we know that he gave over the information about seeing Timothy Coggins at the end. We know he gave over the information about seeing him with three white men. But yes, what he's not saying is, I was doing investigation. I'm trying to develop leads. I want to give it to you because that, that black community is not going to talk to those officers. They're just not. They're going to talk to me. Right. And then even when he did develop the leads and give them over to them, nothing happened with those nothing leads. Nothing was followed up on. And not only that, he was shut down by right. saying, and then after he was shut down. You're, you're road patrol. That's right. That's all you are. You're road patrol. But then he did, you know, in the last clip we played, he said he investigated hundreds of criminal That's investigations. Right. Right. So he was put in his place of road patrol for this, even though he was a supervisor. And so too. remember, remember, he is also subject to a little bit of fear back in the 1982s. He knows the climate better than anyone. He knows what happens to Timothy Coggins. We all knew in that community, apparently, that what the racial motivation was to kill Timothy Coggins. But he's saying this wasn't investigated. So this sets the whole stage as to why now? Why now? Let's take the information we do have. Let's take those leads we did have. Let's reinvestigate them now under today's climate, and hopefully we can get a fair trial for Timothy Coggins' life. Right. And what I think is a beautiful thing is in this case, um, this is justice at play for so many players. It's not only Timothy Coggins and his family, but it's also Jesse Gates, he might just be a witness, but he's a black witness who was silenced, mm -hmm. who couldn't perform his job to the fullest capacity because of his race. And this racially motivated right. case, this is about being uh, vindicated for for an entire race of people living in Sunnyside, Georgia at that time, the entire community right. that was silenced. You're absolutely, you're absolutely this, right. This is, a, this is a case for people to have closure, not just the family, and not just to give uh, Timothy Coggins a proper eulogy and closure, but just to give validation 
to well, the entire black that's community. That's right, but also to say his name and say, Timothy Coggins' case is now the vindication for Talisa Coggins. It's now the vindication for Jesse Gates. It's the vindication for all those people that were scared in the black community who shut down because they knew they were going to get a fair shake, and if they came forward with evidence, they were scared what was going to happen to them. So say his name again, Timothy Coggins, you're doing a beautiful job, your life ended early, but you're really, your life is coming forward now in this trial. Right, so justice is coming forward, and that's what's so beautiful about the American court system, too, especially that's what we're always striving to do. We're always striving to bring justice, because when you're in the streets, you don't always have justice achieved. You know, people take matters into their own hands. But in this case, you know, right now, it is, it is replaying 35 years later, and people who were afraid to have a voice 35 years ago because of their race are now able to come forward and not have their lives and safety at stake for telling the truth and for telling or ratting out the police department for not doing their job and preventing them from doing their job at the time. We are going to continue to follow this trial and follow it closely. We have more witnesses and we're going to have to throw to a quick break, but please stick with us and we will continue to watch this testimony. Stay tuned. Prosecution's opening statements in the Timothy Coggins case, really a sad case. She is setting the stage. Right now, you heard her discussing the injuries of the victim, who is now dead, 35-year-old cold case, racially motivated case. She's talking about the mud in the hair. And she is setting the stage for the juries right now. She is explaining to the juries. You heard it. She said half the evidence is gone potentially destroyed and you're going to hear inconsistencies in the statements but that was 34 35 years ago but the prosecution does make note and promise that they're going to hear the big stuff and they're going to hear what matters in this case with me linda kenny Bodden on set thank you yeah, for thank joining you. me to yeah, talk about this very much. awful case yeah, I mean, i'm happy to be here to discuss this case because this is just a travesty <laughs> like, that occurred back in the 80s and then that's what you said during break you said this is a really important civil rights case that's right that's right, because it, it, it's going to justify and it's going to say, hey, this climate was never acceptable and we're, we're never going to forget. We're going to take people's lives like Timothy Coggins and we're going to reinvestigate them. And it may take 30 years, sometimes it may take 50 years, sometimes it may take 20 years, but we're going to do it. And now we even heard her. She said, this man, Frankie Gebhardt, I don't like saying his name because he shouldn't really be remembered. Right. But he confessed he to this to many people over the years. He was proud of it because the climate was, if you were in the KKK, if you were at rallies, if you were racist, you were loved by that community right. back then. And he said not only did he admit to the killing, the word he used, the N-word, shows that it was racially motivated. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, there, there's just no doubt about it. So I think that the confessions can be very powerful here, despite the lack of other evidence. Those confessions over time, 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 and I'd probably guarantee you there's another snitch recently. That's why it came up now, and that's why it got reinvestigated now. But you know what's going to be interesting, too, is if the police department, the sheriff's department, had those confessions back then and did nothing with them. You know what? I'm sure they did. I mean, we just heard from Jesse Gates, one of the officers who worked at the time, and he was basically told to, to shut up and not talk and to just focus on his job of road patrol, even though he has investigated hundreds of other criminal investigations and he was a supervisor because he was a right. black man trying to right. look out for his friend who was a victim. And he even had his own eyewitness testimony from that night of seeing the three white men outside of the club. And he thought that that was unique and interesting and weird and something to note. Everything was silenced. It was just stopped. That's right. Case closed. That's and he right. said it closed way too fast. That's right. That's right. And for whatever reason, whether or not Gephardt was loved in the community, whether or not they didn't think the life of Timothy Coggins was worth anything, it was closed. I mean, I'd like to know whether or not those three men were ever identified, whether or not they were identified to be Frankie Gephardt. I assume we're going to hear it one way or another, but wouldn't that be interesting if he was standing in front of the club that Timothy Coggins was last It would at? be interesting, but as the prosecution said, much of the evidence is gone. Half of the evidence is probably gone, but we're going to hear what matters, and what matters right now is that we have a medical examiner who's now going to take the stand and talk about the injuries and give us some insight into Timothy Coggins injuries and I agree before we go to that clip that the defendant's name should not be of to not be something of such importance because he doesn't deserve it and that's Frankie Gebhardt and that's the last time I'm going to refer to the case like that the rest of the day today it's going to be Timothy Coggins because that's the person that needs to be remembered we're going to go to that clip 
Welcome back to Law and Crime. If you were watching during that break, we had our very own Linda Kenny Bodden and her husband discussing their story. And with me on set today is the celebrity Linda Kenny Bodden. I like it there. So, and it's perfect timing because we just heard yep. you on break talk about how you met your husband and how he's a forensic pathologist and how he has experience mm -hmm. in medical examination. And in the trial we're covering right now, the Timothy Coggins case, we had the medical examiner on the stand going over the injuries. So I have two questions. Right. The first one is, what is the difference between a medical examiner and a forensic pathologist? Because okay. I didn't really even know that until you told me during break. Right. And the second question is, is why is it necessary to go through every single, you know, puncture and wound to determine the cause of death? I mean, to me, it's just, it's clear. I mean, this is a murder and this guy was brutally killed. Right. Well, a medical examiner is a government-appointed position. For instance, Michael had been chief medical examiner of New York. He was the chief medical examiner for the state police. And Michael's your husband. My husband. Okay. You saw so that great a, wedding picture. That, that's a government-appointed that's a government appointed position where you then uh, can come into court and say what the cause of death is for the government, usually, although sometimes uh, defense attorneys call the medical examiners also. Forensic pathologist is through your training and your board certification that you're able to determine cause of death. Uh, and you go through many years of school to do that. Many medical examiners are forensic pathologists. Some are board certified, some are not board certified. And then there's something called the coroner that has no, usually has no medical training at all. Uh, and they hire doctors who are forensic pathologist, hopefully, to do autopsies. And you met him because he was a forensic pathologist on one of your cases? That's right. I, I hired him to do a second autopsy on a client of mine who had been shot. I had been hired by the family. And I so, wanted it, so that's how I met him. Correct. Not to make light of a dead body, but over someone's dead body, you got together. Yeah, it wasn't usually husband. the normal romantic situation. But uh, but Michael, you know, has been doing this for a long time. Um, so, so, so yeah, so then you have a lot of insight and experience just listening to these stories at home even. Mm -hmm. So why do we have to hear about every single puncture and wound? I mean, we saw those pictures before break, those gruesome pictures that I should have warned you about before putting up on the screen in case you didn't want to see that. But why is it necessary, Linda, to have to brutalize the viewers and the jurors with, you know, that gruesome blow by blow by blow. Obviously, he's mutilated. Yeah, Isn't yes, that yeah. enough? No, sure. I mean, you and I can look at those pictures and say he probably died of stab wounds. That's, but, but under the law, there has to be, you have to prove it in court, usually by the governmental entity, the medical examiner. But there's more to it here because there'll be confessions, I anticipate, wherein, wherein the defendant would have said, Gebar would have said how he killed uh, Mr. Timothy Coggins. And so what the medical examiner does by talking about how many stab wounds, meaning there are puncture wounds, and how many incised wounds, meaning there were cuts, or how many defensive wounds, meaning Coggins was being attacked and he put his hands up or his arms up and to try to ward off the knife, knife blows to him, um, that could also give credibility to the defendant's confessions over the years. If the defendant said all these things of how he killed Timothy Coggins, and it turns out this is how he killed him, and you and I can't tell that. We can tell he died of stab. We don't we don't know about size wounds versus stab wounds. That gives credibility to those confessions. Okay, so right. So in this case right now, what we're listening to is the medical examiner, Warren Tillman. And Warren is going through each injury and each stab wound and each head injury blow by blow, so to speak, for real, blow by blow, to help determine the cause of death. We have more testimony on the stand in the courtroom from the medical examiner that we're going to go back to now, and then we're going to have more in-studio analysis to dissect this and discuss it. So let's take a look. That is Marin Williams. We're watching in the courtroom right now. I can still hear him in my ear testifying. Um, we're hearing him discuss. He is the neighbor of the defendant, and he is laying out foundational testimony of the defendant's house, uh, what he was doing, barbecuing outside. Um, Linda, you're still with me on yes. set. I only have you a few more minutes, so I want to give you the opportunity to comment on this case. I know you're prepared on it, and we got to go in live. We've been jumping around today, so before you go, what, what do you want to say? The issue is murder versus aggravated manslaughter. Manslaughter, defense is going to try to say he didn't mean to kill him, no intent in there for manslaughter. Prosecution's going to say he knew when he put him underwater. That basically forms intent. Right. It's the case. So, well, thank you, Linda. She's signing off for today. Thank she's you. a great guest. And she's going to be also hosting here at Long Crime at some times. So we're excited to have her. And uh, we have to go to a quick break, so stick with us.